Um, we'll hand it over to Dr. Elizabeth Evans. Thank you very much, Ashley, and greetings to everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Evans, and I'm the Provost and Vice President Academic at Mount Royal University in Calgary, Alberta. And I am really honored to welcome everyone to surviving and thriving throughout the pandemic. An Alberta Indigenous Women's Entrepreneurship Roundtable brought to you in partnership by the Women's Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub, Mount Royal University, Alberta Women's Entrepreneurs, and Futurepreneur. I'd like to start by acknowledging that Mount Royal University is situated in an ancient and, and um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, ancient and storied place within the hereditary lands of the Nitsipia, Blackfoot, uh, Yare, Nakoda, Sutina, and the Métis Nations. It is a land steeped in ceremony and history that until recently was used and occupied exclusively by Indigenous peoples. Mount Royal University is committed to doing its part to address the legacy of broken promises and to rebuild the relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Calgary and across the country. In this virtual format, I recognize that many of you are joining us today from various territories across the province and perhaps even from across the country. And I invite you to share with us in the chat the traditional territory you are joining us from. If you are not uh, as familiar with Zoom, then please find the um, Zoom um, bar uh, at the bottom of your screen, the toolbar, where you can select the chat feature and enter um, your information. Today's discussion will be both inspirational and practical. The pandemic has put so much strain on our ecosystem, but today you are to hear from Indigenous women who have risen to the occasion to pivot their businesses to meet new demands. Indigenous women who have both survived and thrived throughout this pandemic. To minimize the disruptions with our speakers, we ask that you use the mute feature also on the toolbar uh, in the lower part of the Zoom screen. That will help maximize the sound quality. I would now like to introduce Elder Denise Montour, who will start us off in a very good way. Elder Denise Montour is of Chippewa Cree ancestry, third youngest child of George and Helen Montour, and a family member of 12 children. Elder Montour was raised by both parents whom lived a paradigm for inherent knowledge and Indigenous <clears throat> wisdoms of the Chippewa Cree ancestry. She's a proud mother of three children and <clears throat> newcomb for eight grandchildren. Elder Montour values and seeks a life healthier than the current and strives to add to her family's future by living a life worthy of being proud of it. She is an evolving woman, rooted and constantly in transitional healing within herself to accommodate an increasingly unpredictable future for women, children, and families. It is my honor to welcome Elder Denise Montour. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you all uh, for the invitation today to start your beautiful session with an opening prayer. And so I'm asking you to, to pray with me in the way that you know how, to set the intention for all of us to have an open mind and heart and spirit by inviting the source of our all of us, all of our energy from a beautiful, beautiful being that we, uh, we recognize or I've been taught to understand as a creator father and a creator mother and, uh, and, and the family of the universe. And so I pray with me and join with me in good intention and happy, joyful intention to set our day 
uh, as I begin now in my language, the Cree language. Han mamo tawino, kse manto, kse manto isque, kse manto gusan kista, hawe mamsito tata guka kio, nia poata mokana way to go and see gaspan, nia uti maskan totin. How kakio e mamsito tata guka pe weeds wheat up in miak, how kape sito scoa te kakio geni ti squawak. Kakio ka openakik, a mu mountainetigan, mu tehe, mu ataka. Gamu tata goats. Kakio gamu waska wita, kakiama kape nuts, kape nuts and nake tikota, kape wasagama piak, and not some maka no teki sita tik hawik samakia, kape witi hatik, kakio kioa. Hey, hey, thank you. Thank you so much, Elder Denise Montour and Dr. Elizabeth Evans um, for opening today's session. Uh, really, really excited to be here today. So um, maybe some of you are returning from last year's roundtables. Maybe some of you are new. Um, so like I said, I'm working with the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub on their National Indigenous Outreach and Partnership Strategy. Uh, and I'm joined by uh, my colleague Kara Thorvaldson and also Anita Kemp. So a lot of you might recognize Anita more than you recognize me. Uh, so Anita works with our WEC Alberta hub uh, with Mount Royal University. Um, so early last year when I started in this position, um, Anita reached out to me um, already ready to plan um, an Indigenous women's entrepreneurship event. And she said, you know, it's great that you're working here. I'd really love to collaborate with you. So um, we were working to plan um, this really beautiful half day in person event. And then as everyone now is well aware, um, we've been in, you know, a pandemic for uh, the better part of this past year. So we changed what we were doing um, to switch to a virtual format. Um, our first virtual roundtable for Alberta Indigenous women entrepreneurs was really well attended and we could sense that um, there was, I guess, eagerness in the ecosystem to continue having discussions. So we held a second round table um, later in the summer uh, for Northern Alberta. Um, and the purpose of the round tables last year was to have discussions around not only the challenges and barriers that are unique to Indigenous women entrepreneurs, but to get a perspective and discussion facilitated around what the future of an inclusive innovation ecosystem looks like from an Indigenous woman's perspective. So at the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub, our work is all centered around building this inclusive innovation ecosystem for women entrepreneurs across the country. So working with all levels of government, organizations that are supporting women entrepreneurs and building um, the sense of cohesiveness and collaboration together. So um, my role is essentially doing all of that, but just ensuring that Indigenous women entrepreneurs are included um, in this vision. So we held um, the two Alberta roundtables, plus another 14 roundtables in the different regions across Canada. And we brought together uh, just over 350 participants. So having discussions around like, what was your story in entrepreneurship? How did you get started? What are the unique challenges and barriers you faced? And what would you like to see going forward? Uh, so we compiled uh, all of that information and put it together into a comprehensive needs analysis on Indigenous women's entrepreneurship. So last August, uh, Kara and I, um, we participated in a traditional naming ceremony uh, with Elder Margaret Lavely here in Manitoba, and she gave uh, the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub the traditional name of Miguam Makwa Ikwe, 
which means ice bear woman in Ojibwe. And as she explained to us, the ice bear is the symbol of courage and strength. And it's a spirit that not only walks alongside all indigenous women entrepreneurs, but it's a spirit that can be found within them. Uh, so the report that we compiled um, was uh, named using our traditional name. Um, and we actually had the report and concept designed by an Indigenous woman in Alberta. Some of you might be familiar with Crossing Design. Um, so she, I explained the name to her and she had free creative reign um, to design something based on that. And so I think Anita will share the link in the chat to the report. I encourage you uh, to read the report um, and you know, just have a look at the beautiful designs and symbolisms found throughout. Um, I really wanted to bring um, like more than just a needs analysis, more than a report that goes over the challenge and barriers. I wanted to bring these to life through stories. So there's actually, I think around 10 different vignettes of um, different Indigenous women entrepreneurs featured throughout the report, um, sharing their journeys in their own words. Um, and you'll actually be hearing uh, from one of them today. So that's very exciting. Um, I'll now introduce uh, our first portion, uh, our, sorry, our first panel. So we're gonna start out with a panel from our ecosystem organizations. They're gonna present to you some of the services and opportunities that are available um, for you to take advantage of. And then we're gonna go into a panel with our indigenous women entrepreneurs. And we're gonna hear um, just in their own words, their stories, um, how they've you know, survived and thrived throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, things that they had to do, changes they had to make. Uh, and then we're gonna open it up to our round table discussion, which will be moderated um, by my colleague, Kara. So during the round table portion, that's gonna be the opportunity for absolutely anyone to jump in and share in the conversation. Um, this is just a feel good uh, panel. This, uh, this gathering isn't um, fueled by the need to write a report, um, but um, please feel free uh, if you feel inspired to um, share this recording with your colleagues afterwards. Um, so really excited to be partnering with Alberta Women Entrepreneurs and Futurepreneur uh, to bring this event to you. Um, we've partnered on all of the roundtables thus far, and I think that we are a really good working group. Um, it's always great working with Bev and Sammy. Um, so I'll introduce Bev and Sammy first. So uh, Bev Ladder is working with the Alberta Women Entrepreneurs and brings over 20 years project management experience dedicated to supporting Indigenous communities in the delivery economic development plans, training to employment programs, business development for business growth, and entrepreneurial development for economic impact. Over the years, this work has focused on developing partnerships with First Nations communities, industry, and governments to turn concepts into realities for the benefits of communities and their peoples. With Alberta Women Entrepreneurs as a program specialist, she is the project lead for Strengthening Partnerships, launched in 2019, and continues to work with all women to make their dreams a reality. Bev has a passion for facilitating, mentoring, and coaching Indigenous women entrepreneurs. She is a mother of three and a daughter and is a member of the Montreal Cree Nation in Northern Saskatchewan. Having been raised on the land has nurtured her appreciation of nature and the beauty of these resources for healing. Uh, so I will next introduce Sammy. Uh, so Sammy is the business development manager for Indigenous young entrepreneurs with Futurepreneur Canada for the provinces of Alberta and British Columbia. Originally from Thunderchild, Saskatchewan, she has lived in Edmonton for the past 20 years and has been proudly supporting Indigenous entrepreneurs for the past four years successfully launching their businesses. So Bev and Sammy, really happy and excited to be partnering with you again. Uh, so after we hear from Bev and Sammy, we're gonna go into our um, next presentations from uh, Mackenzie Brown. Uh, so Mackenzie Brown is a First Nations Cree woman from Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation and currently resides in a Miss, oh wow, I should have asked how to pronounce this ahead of time. Um, you got it, you got it. Amiskwachi Waskahegan. 
Edmonton. <laughs> Brown has a background as a performer, drummer, tourism entrepreneur, philanthropist, and advocate for at-risk youth in the Edmonton area in addition to her past roles in Indigenous tourism development with both the government of Alberta and Edmonton Tourism. She's currently the project manager with Indigenous Tourism Alberta. Next, we'll hear from Lisa Ford. Uh, so Lisa Ford is the general manager for Community Futures Lakeland and currently resides in Cold Lake, Alberta with her three active little daughters. She has a degree in business economics, focusing on business management and her work experiences encompasses business corporate accounting, business advising for startups and community economic development. In addition to her work experience, Lisa has been nominated multiple times for uh, Women of Influence Awards, and she is a tremendous advocate for women entrepreneurs in rural Alberta. So as you can see, we have a very, very well-rounded um, group of presentations. Uh, so I will pass the floor over now to Bev to get us started. Thank you so much for that, Ashley. I appreciate uh, everyone. Um, I'm here in Calgary uh, in the area of Treaty 7. So I'm really privileged to work with the, the, the people here, the Blackfoot and the, the Dene and the Nakoda. So I appreciate the discussion. And I'm going to just pull up a, a small PowerPoint presentation just so you can capture an idea about what it is that uh, we're about. I'm just going to share. I'm going to pull it up. Here we go. All right. So Alberta Women Entrepreneurs has been here for 25 years, and we've been dedicated to helping uh, women entrepreneurs as we continue to uh, support not only from startups, but from the growth. One of the interesting facts is that um, although we're very active in the economic uh, growth and area of Canada, um, the needle has not moved for the last 10 years. So we can see that there are challenges that we're still uh, working with. And particularly, I want to hear from the women entrepreneurs today to, to see how can we help you? Because I think this is really a a table of which you can provide your input. And I really appreciate you taking time to be with us today. Um, we are marking our 25th anniversary last year. Uh, we've helped uh, women across all sectors and sizes. Um, we've helped women start up and actually reinvent themselves. So I think that one of the things that we've seen through the course is that if you help women, throughout the course of their entrepreneurship, they're more likely to be successful over the long term. So it's ever changing environment that we work in, in terms of, as you can see, um, the, the challenges that we face. So I think that uh, we, we need you to know that we're here to support you in all of your endeavors. And each of us partners will work very closely to, to help. Um, if we don't have the answer, we'll find the answer for you. And we'll definitely connect you to all the resources that we're connected with. Um, this last year, we launched our first Indigenous Entrepreneur Award, a long time coming. And the, the uh, one who um, won the award, or was one of the recipients, there were a number of worthy recipients, I must say, uh, it's Koyala Carrington. She runs the Absolute Combustion International. You can take a look at her on uh, LinkedIn. Um, she's an amazing woman and uh, connect with her. She's just there available to assist you in any questions that you might have. As we can see that 37% of women are in high growth area. But what we're finding is that not in, with Indigenous women is we're twice as likely as our counterparts to be entrepreneurs. And so through our entrepreneurship, we're able to support ourselves, our families and our children. As you know, um, as Indigenous women, we don't keep the wealth for ourselves. We share it with the community and we help our loved ones. And as we can see, there's Alberta is a broad and vast, beautiful province. Um, we see that the, the, the disparity in some of the, the, uh, the participation of women, but also I think that as Indigenous women, we're really leading the way in terms of how we are moving forward. 
Um, I just wanted to talk briefly about our Next Steps to Success program. As you're aware, we, we offer the business plan learning series and it's a module that we bring that's been developed and there's uh, actual workbooks and uh, we work through it with you. We uh, developed it so that it has language in which is understandable. We are introducing some finance language, obviously, which is part of it, but we wanna take the mystery of what is a business plan and we wanna walk you through it. And I think one of the significant things is helping you after. Some women have the business plan done by the time of the course, some take three years, some take a year. It's very unique in terms of the context of the woman and we want to help you design it specifically for what you want. And so we don't want business plans to be a scary endeavor. We want it to be really practical, really, you know, um, the foundation and, and to help you uh, walk through the, the context, the content, and also what does it mean for you? So what we've had is we've had 500 Indigenous women come through our program. We see that 60% of the women that are taking our programs have gone on to actually start or grow their businesses. And there are a number of them that are actually saying, okay, you know, maybe entrepreneurship is not ready for me. It's not for me today, but it's something that I'm going to learn and I can apply those skills in other areas of my business. So um, we're, we work closely with partners across Alberta. You can see that. Um, we do have an industry partner. Um, social enterprise is a significant part of our of how we work and how we do business. So um, Momentum also has a program called the Thrive Program. I wanted to just to mention that because they also offer a social enterprise conference. In fact, uh, they've nominated women to be funded for them to go to their annual conference uh, in the West Coast. So if this is something that you're interested in, uh, please reach out to me and I can make, make that connection. I can nominate you. But really, women are helping each other. And so um, the areas that we focus on are obviously the connections, connecting to services, connecting to other women. We provide low um, development lending anywhere from 10000 to 150000 um, There's a, a specific area for Indigenous women that will help you through uh, developing your, your business plan. Um, we're obviously looking to market expansion. What we mean by that is looking beyond our borders, look, looking beyond not only Alberta, but also globally. How can we help you connect to the expertise and the services that are developed by Export Canada? They have a free online course delivery that's, that's amazing. I, I just like to point that out. And uh, we have performance learning series that are going to be introduced later this year. And we're going to actually take some pieces and say, okay, um, if there's certain topics that you're interested that you need, then we will deliver these short webinars for you. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out with the Next Step to Success program, we have to stop delivering them into communities because of COVID, but uh, we're going to be launching our, our virtual sessions here um, in the new year, in the next fiscal year. So look for um, the highlights of that when that comes out. What I would suggest also is women is to sign up for the newsletters for the service providers, then you're going to get the more updated, you know, workshops that are available to you. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Uh, thank you for giving me the time to speak today, and I'll turn it back to um, Ashley. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much, Bev. Um, yeah, and you know, initially when I started at WEC, uh, one of our first things that we were all tasked with was putting together an ecosystem mapping of all the supports across Canada that are available for women entrepreneurs. And so I put together the mapping for Indigenous women entrepreneurs. And I think something that's really important to point out is um, the uniqueness of BEV's program with next steps to success. Like there's absolutely nothing else like it across the country, it's completely unique. Um, so in terms of, you know, if you're looking for best practices or maybe how to get started and, you know, developing and creating programming for um, Indigenous women, 
that's a really good program to look at. Um, Bev and I actually did have meetings with um, other organizations in other provinces where she helped them get started um, on their journey creating programming. So um, those are the connections that we're hoping to uh, promote and foster here at WEC. Um, so next, uh, we'll hear from our other event partner, Sammy. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I also too will share my screen really quickly here. Um, so quick. I'm trying to figure out how to start this. I think if, yeah, you click slideshow, then you should be able to, yeah. This bar was just in the way here. <laughs> All right. All right. So um, I am working with Futurepreneur Canada. So I am the business development manager for Alberta and BC for Indigenous Young Entrepreneurs, as Ashley mentioned. Um, so I just wanted to go over um, some of the programs that we do offer. Um, we do have, can you guys see this black bar on the top here? Or is it just me? Uh, we just see the slide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So I can start with um, our main core program. So um, we do have a startup program, um, and we do offer up to sixty thousand dollars in a personal guaranteed loan. Um, so we are in partnership with BDC with this. Um, so twenty of it actually comes from Futurepreneur Canada, and the other forty comes from BDC. Um, we do not combine interest rates on these loans. So the 20,000 is sitting at 6.2 and then uh, the 40,000 is sitting at 9.5. Um, so for the 20,000, we are unsecured, but for the 40,000 BDC would need um, at least 10% down for that 40,000. Um, so we are character-based. We do check your credit. Um, in order for you to qualify, you do have to have pretty good credit. Um, and then we require a two-year business plan and, or a, a business plan and a two-year cash flow. Sorry. Um, so we do have resources to help you create that. Um, and then what's really kind of unique about this program is that we do offer two years of mentorship. Um, so we kind of do an assessment for the, with the entrepreneur, um, and we kind of see where they're kind of lacking skills, I guess. And then we would go into our database of volunteer mentors and kind of handpick um, one that would be, um, I guess, more advanced in the skills that you're, you, you need support in um, when you're running your business. Um, so, oh, sorry, here's the, I guess, the loan terms. So I, again, the 20,000 sitting at 6.2 and then the 40,000 is sitting at 9.5. Um, we are on a flexible five-year repayment term. Um, and then for the first year, we are only offering, or you would only have to pay the interest. Um, and then the second year is when you would start paying your principal. Um, so for the Futurepreneur 20,000, you can repay it early without a penalty fee. Um, but with the BDC's 40,000, they do have a, a small penalty fee if you'd wanted to pay back early. Um, so some of our eligibility requirements for our program is you do have to be 18 to 39. Um, that's the age demographic that we do serve all across the country. Um, you do have to be Canadian citizen, permanent resident of Canada. Um, if you are a student, you do have to be in your final years of studies. Um, and this is just because if um, you're taking this program, then you do need to start, have intent to start your business full time within the next 12 months of starting the program. Um, so you do have to be past the research and development stage. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't help you or support you through that, but um, we do also have partnering organizations that we can kind of um, send you to before you're ready to start up with this program. Um, we do need you to produce um, a viable business plan by the end of the process. Like I said, we do have tools that I'll talk about in a second um, to help you do that. Um, and if you already have a business started, you do have to be full-time, um, less than 12 months in operation. Um, and you do have to be willing to work with that mentor again for two years. 
Um, so this is our second program. So this is our side hustle program. And um, this is for entrepreneurs who are looking to start their business, um, but not full time within the, the next 12 months of starting this side hustle program. So you have to stay part time for at least 12 months. Um, so we do offer up to $15,000. Um, it's on a three year repayment schedule. Um, and you do have to, this is for entrepreneurs who may be working full time or maybe going to school full time, but you do have to demonstrate a full sustainable income. Um, and again, with this one, you do get matched with that mentor for two years. Um, there's no business plan required. We do do an assessment on you, but you do need to have your cash flow um, with this one. So to your cash flow. <clears throat> um, 6.2, it's pretty much the same, 6.2%. Um, we don't require any down payment for this one. We're not partnered with BDC for this one. So no down payment. Um, this one's on a three year repayment term, um, no interest um, only period. I do believe it's for a month um, or a few months. So um, future premier for the 15,000, you can definitely repay without a penalty fee on this one as well. Um, so this side hustle program is actually really good because I, I meet a lot of indigenous entrepreneurs who kind of do sewing or beading, regalia making on the side and they do have full-time employment or maybe going to school. Um, and they really don't think that they're, you know, they're, they think that it's more of a hobby to them, um, but it is a business. It's, it's a definitely a business um, that you can kind of keep on the side. Um, and it's just people, Entrepreneurs don't really realize that your hobby is really a business if you are selling your products. Um, so I do see a lot of that with Indigenous entrepreneurs and they do come from, and it's really awesome that you do get that to your um, mentorship as well. Um, again, for the mentoring. Um, so Devin Brooks is one of our mentors and she has been mentored through us. So just a little, little quote from her. Uh, so this is just the difference between the side hustle and the startup. Um, for the side hustle, you don't need any, no training, no experience in the relevant field um, that you're starting up a business in. Um, but for our startup program, we do like to see that you do have training or experience in the business. Um, and again, less than 12 months, you do have to be running with, startup pro with the startup program and looking to start up full time. Um, I think I just, kind of repeating myself on that one. But here's some of our resources that are really good. So our business plan writer is a free online tool. <clears throat> you do have to register for it. You don't have to take our program to access this tool. Um, so it's a really interactive online tool. Um, it asks you questions, it gives you tips and examples on how to fill out those questions. And then by the end of it, it spits out a business plan. Um, so it would have all of your main contents of a business plan, you won't be missing anything out of it. Um, and then we also do have our cash flow template. So our cash flow template is through an Excel sheet and it's already pre-populated pre -populated with all of the formulas. So it's broken down monthly for two years and it really gives you your whole overview of your financials as a business. So it'll tell you how much money you need to start up, um, how much money you're gonna be bringing in, how much revenue you're gonna be bringing in, um, what um, is going out of your business, like all of your expenses. And then at the end of it, it communicates all of your, um, your, banks, your bank um, statement at the end of each month. So it'll, it'll tell you how much you have sitting at the end of each month. And it's, really, it's a really good tool for entrepreneurs to use. Um, like I said, it just gives you that whole financial overview. Um, instead of having your numbers everywhere, it's in one document and it really, um, kind of puts in perspective to see exactly what you need to start your business and exactly what you need um, to be bringing in to be successful and sustainable uh, for two years of operating your business. So definitely check out that tool. Um, so those are the two, two, two tools that we do um, ha have for you as an entrepreneur. And um, those ones you do not have to use um, or go through our program, like I said, and I can also walk you through both of those tools as well. Um, 
Um, we also do offer our entrepreneur and residence support. So it's just extra support working through your business plan and your cash flow as well. Um, so it goes into a really high level um, instructions on how to create your business plan. And um, with our entrepreneur and residence, you if you take their webinar, um, then you do have up to five one-on-one -on -one virtual coaching sessions with them. So it's just that um, definitely extra support working through those documents uh, for entrepreneurs looking to start their business. And if I can't give them the support that they actually really need, if they need more support than I can give them, then our entrepreneur and residence is really ready to kind of step up and take over. So this is just how I, how I kind of work with the entrepreneur. But we do emails, phone calls. Um, I walk you through um, the application process. Um, and then I help you get your business plan and cash flow ready. I do a quick review of them and then I do a follow up as well. So then um, they can go on to the next phase of the application process because there are about three phases to that. To that. Um, so I would be the first phase, um, and then our second phase would be our CRM, and our third phase would be adjudication, who would actually take a look over all of the documents that we've helped create and uh, with the entrepreneur and then give the final approval or not. Um, so that's just how our program works, and this is my contact information if anybody has any questions or um, anything like that, but I will stop sharing. And thanks, Ashley, for having me again. Definitely, Sammy, thank you so much um, for sharing all of that information on your programs. I think what's really great about Futurepreneur, um, again, you know, setting an example for um, what the ecosystem can do to make their programming more accessible for um, young Indigenous entrepreneurs. It's about recognizing what the barriers are and what barriers your programming might um, be presenting. And, you know, I think, I don't think anybody intentionally creates these barriers, but it's just this initial recognition that they do exist and then adapting your programming to make it more inclusive. Um, so really enjoyed that presentation. And then I think in our post communications, I can try to um, include the, sl uh, the slideshow presentations that we're looking at today in case you want to follow up on some of the information that's shared. Um, so next we'll be hearing uh, from Mackenzie Brown. Tansay everybody. Tansay no totamak. Kamamak Mackenzie Brown nitsigasan. Uh, Hi, everybody. I'm Mackenzie. I'm the project manager with Indigenous Tourism Alberta. Uh, I'm originally from Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation, but I make Edmonton my home. And first off, just wanted to say thank you so much for having me today. And thank you again to Sammy and Bev. Uh, we are big fans of Futurepreneur and AWE. And uh, yeah, I actually met Bev because I took I took the uh, AWE Steps to Success and uh, it was fantastic. And that's basically how I learned business development when I started in Indigenous tourism a couple years back. So, so thank you so much again. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen quickly here because I have a, I have just a short presentation. Um, give me a thumbs up if you can see it. <laughs> Perfect, fantastic. Um, so yes, I work with Indigenous Tourism Alberta, and what Indigenous Tourism Alberta is, is we are a not-for-profit membership-based society, uh, and we work in developing and marketing authentic Indigenous tourism experiences across the province. So we were created in 2018, so we are a young but fierce company, and we have our mission, and our mission is to grow and promote authentic, sustainable, and culturally rich Indigenous tourism experiences, showcasing Alberta as a premier Indigenous tourism destination. And our vision is to see the Indigenous peoples of Alberta thrive through a financially sustainable Indigenous tourism economy, sharing culture and stories. So our membership is created of businesses that are 51% Indigenously owned. Um, so that is one of our criteria. And then we are also created from something that's called industry partners. So those people, those companies that want to help support the growth of Indigenous tourism. 
Uh, we have four strategic pillars and we have different programs that fall into each strategic pillar. So the one, oh, so I'll get to that, but in a second, I'll go a bit through the landscape of what Indigenous tourism looks like right now. So we were really created because the way that you do Indigenous tourism development, the same way with Indigenous business development, is very different than working with people who are not Indigenous. Um, most of the time, culture is in play. Um, you know, there's Indigenous beliefs, Indigenous worldviews that we bring in, and that's really what sets us apart from, from uh, the rest of the business world. And so we were created to help grow the Indigenous tourism space within Alberta because tourism in Alberta in 2016, these are all pre-COVID, um, but in 2016, there were 34.8 million person visits. And that means that the total amount of tourism expenditures is $8.5 billion. Um, so it's a really large, part of our Alberta economy. And then we see Indigenous tourism. So in 2017, Indigenous tourism in Alberta made a $166.2 million GDP contribution and employed over 3,000 people. So that's really fantastic. And in 2019, we found that there is about 160 Indigenous tourism businesses in Alberta which is phenomenal. So we were really created because we needed to cater towards uh, Indigenous tourism entrepreneurs and to have these programs that, yeah, follow the authenticity of culture, uh, that follow protocol, that engage with communities and just work with Indigenous communities in a different way. So we are created by different members. And currently we have 104 members. So our members are either in development or they're all the way up to being something that's called export ready, which means that they're working with international markets. They have the, they're working with travel trade, big tour companies uh, that are bringing tourists here to Canada. And then the demand for Indigenous experiences, which is really exciting, is one in four domestic travellers are looking for an authentic Indigenous tourism experience. So that's one in four Canadians, which is really great, uh, especially in light of COVID, because we still find that a lot of people are trying to explore their backyard, uh, still want to engage in going on fun Indigenous experiences. And then one in three international travellers are interested in an Indigenous experience. So as I had mentioned, we have our four different pillars. The first pillar, uh, which is the one that I primarily work in, is development. And so these are the different programs that we have for Indigenous tourism development. So we do put on a Indigenous tourism entrepreneur workshop. Uh, so we take people through kind of business startup, what is the tourism industry, working in the tourism industry, and then creating your tourism business. We just finished doing a province-wide one last week, but we're going to be doing another province-wide one in March. Then we also have our Indigenous Tourism Alberta Community Readiness Workshop. So this was created because we have a lot of First Nations communities and Métis settlement communities that want to have community tourism that is community owned. So a great example of this is like Métis Crossing, uh, which is owned and operated by the Métis Nation of Alberta, or something like River Creek Casino owned and operated by Enoch Cree Nation. So we created this community readiness workshop that takes communities through tourism and creating something that is community-based, grassroots created, and community owned and operated. And then we also have our cultural awareness program, and this is for industry partners, uh, because we realized that once we started working with a lot of industry partners, some non-Indigenous organizations just don't have the awareness of Indigenous tourism, of our culture. And so this was created for that. 
Um, we also have stimulus relief funds and micro grants. So right now we have our marketing micro grant that's out right now, and it's going to be closing in about two or three weeks. So people who are what's called market ready or export ready can apply for a $4,000 um, grant. And then we had a stimulus relief fund earlier. Then we also have our Indigenous Tourism Summit. And so that happens every year. Uh, last year, we were able to pivot and we did three roadshow summits. So we did a smaller summit outdoors at Métis Crossing. And then we did a smaller summit at Great Eagle. And then we did a virtual summit. Uh, so this year, we're hoping we can do a big one, but it's all COVID dependent. So we might be shifting again as well. And then on our Indigenous Tourism Alberta website, we have about 15 different webinars um, that all have to do with development, uh, whether it's marketing on a, on a tiny budget, creating a website, uh, the national guidelines, working with travel trade. We have those as well as an up-to-date resource list on various funds and supports available. And then our final program in development is our pathway program. And it's kind of like a launch off of our community readiness workshop, but it's all done online, which is great, uh, especially during COVID right now. So we take a cohort of about five communities every year and we take them through, again, community-based tourism planet, planning. Then we have our marketing pillar. So we have a variety of content creation projects. Uh, we have our consumer website where, pe where our members are a part of. Uh, we do conference and trade show attendance. So a lot of times these kind of trade shows are expensive and so we'll go on behalf of our members and uh, and talk to the people at the trade shows about our members and then we also do partnership marketing campaigns so if you're if you're a member we will typically if we're working with let's say Calgary tourism you're in Calgary tourism we will highlight your business uh, if your business is ready to take visitors we have our leadership and partnership uh, so this is this is really where our partnership with AWE and Futurepreneur comes in. Uh, we're partners, so we work with we work with our various partners across the province um, to grow Indigenous tourism, to prioritize Indigenous tourism industry wide, building strategic partnerships, and then moving forward together so we have just created our strategic recovery for 2020 and 2024 uh just because of covid so we ended up shifting our strategy a bit and that's going to be available online for people to take a look at to see what we're going to be working on coming up in the future um but yeah, it's really it's really working towards kind of like that resiliency of the indigenous tourism economy during COVID. So that's it. That's all that I have for you guys today. Uh, if you ever have any questions, we do have a couple different emails. So if you have some general questions, feel free to email us at info at indigenous tourism alberta.ca and then if people are ever interested in development or membership, then we have our various emails there as well. But uh, thank you guys so much for, for, for listening to me and listening to all of the programs that we have at Indigenous Tourism Alberta. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation, Mackenzie. Um, <clears throat> and next, uh, Lisa Ford from Community Futures. Hello, ladies. Thank you so much. Um, also, thumbs up. Can everybody see my screen? Good. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm honored to be here with you. My name is Lisa Ford. So I'm the general manager for Community Futures in Lakeland. And I just want to acknowledge that I'm speaking today from Treaty 6. And in my Community Futures Lakeland region, we have three First Nations and two Métis settlements. And so 
I just want to be quick and give you an overview of the Community Futures program and give you an idea of some of the things that we do to work with women entrepreneurs. So my screen, there we go. Can everybody see the second slide there? Okay, we're working. Fantastic. Technology works sometimes, but we are rural, so you never know. So in Community Futures, we are a not-for-profit. We are funded by federally funded money through Western Economic Diversification. I like to say, well, we say that we are a rural grassroots program. So that just means that we try to identify the needs in our rural areas and try to work towards building those economies. So we are a developmental lender. And that just means that when banks say no due to stricter lending criteria, we look at other aspects such as is this business good for our community and does it create jobs and does it support minor minority entrepreneurs and so we can sometimes say yes when the banks say no. So in Alberta there's actually 27 offices available so we are spread all through the rural area. So the purpose for Community Futures really is to help our rural communities develop and implement local solutions and challenges and meet these opportunities. So if you were a business in a city center, you know that there's all kinds of amazing programs such as Futurepreneur and uh, Business Link and such. And this is not the case so much in the rural areas. So we try to create a friendly economic culture so that we can promote new businesses and grow our businesses for more sustainable economies here. So we achieve those purposes through business loans of up to $150,000. We engage our local economic development projects. We do all kinds of projects in our areas here, and we do free business training and coaching. And so those three pillars, the first one, we have business loans. So we also can partner with everybody. We partner with the banks, we partner with BDC and Futurepreneur, but basically, when a bank says no, then you can come to us and we can give you customized affordable loans. We can provide loans and help you have the best chance of success because we realize that when you are successful, our whole uh, community and economy is successful and we're all rising together. We were blessed enough to be able to offer the triple RF, so the Regional Relief and Recovery Fund through the Community Futures branches. And basically we are a catch all for the businesses that didn't qualify for the SEVA. So we were able to help some of our businesses through COVID that were struggling. So we were happy to do that. So the second piece that we have in our mandate is for community economic projects. And so one of the projects that we're working on in the Northeast, and we realized that through COVID, so many people are just struggling and their businesses can't operate because of the shutdown. And so we all know that there's such a need to be able to operate your business online. And so in the Northeast, some of the community futures came together in our offices and we, we funded this website for businesses. And I know that there's websites everywhere, but we wanted to lower the barriers so that we could keep our rural stores and businesses open. And so this Alberta Eye Market is just being launched now and it has very low cost. And I, I suggest that you all look it up because this is something that's really gonna be necessary moving forward for our businesses to help them sell and stay alive. So we were happy to be able to do that as well. And so the other piece that we do is business training and coaching. And so when a business comes in, we like to come alongside them and just make sure that they have what they need. We do one-on-one -on -one coaching. We evaluate their business and find what they're missing. And then we connect them to resources. We don't know everything, but we do work with other partners and we'll connect them to accountants or lawyers or help them do their business plan and that kind of, of counseling long-term so that they can be successful. We help them with research services like primary services when they're doing their primary research. And then we connect them with Business Link, who's amazing at doing secondary research for our businesses as well. So again, we do the business funding up to 150,000, but we don't just fund the business and send them on their way. We do come alongside them again and just make sure that now they're open, now they're operating. And once they're operating, then there's more pieces like marketing and there's more pieces like like getting a strategy to sell their products. And so we, we kind of like from cradle to grave, stay with this business to make sure that they're successful. 
And then of course we do all kinds of programs and workshops and we collaborate and we, we do anything that a business is doing. We'll survey the community and we'll say, what are you looking for? And we try to provide those workshops. And so of course we love women entrepreneurs and another a project that came through Community Futures was this Project Gazelle. And this was for women entrepreneurs because we know that women do business differently. So this Project Gazelle tries to meet the softer skills for women that are sometimes missing. Uh, we do book clubs, we, we evaluate your personality. What kind of personality do you have as a woman? What kind of business are you gonna run? Like we try to identify that. We also provide mentorship and training and workshops that are specific to women entrepreneurs. And so, like I said, we know that women do business different and women are more likely to build relationships and networks, kind of what we're doing right now. We want to support each other and watch each other grow. And so we want to celebrate that and promote that as much as possible. So I am Lisa Ford and we are Community Futures and we would love to partner with you or help you in any way. Feel free to reach out to us. And if you want the slides, I'd love to help you and get them to you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Um, that was a really great presentation. So thank you, Bev, Sammy, Mackenzie, and Lisa for those presentations. Um, I think everyone has a ton of information uh, to leave this session with. Um, and now I'll um, just bring us into the last portion of our circle today. Um, so now we're going to be hearing from uh, Indigenous women entrepreneurs in Alberta. Um, they're just going to share uh, their stories with us today. Um, so I will introduce both of them. <clears throat> so first we'll be hearing from Crystal Lucier. So Crystal is an accountant, an herbalist, and a serial entrepreneur. Uh, recently, Crystal had a COVID breakdown and has had to learn how to completely pivot into a new life. We'll also hear from Nicole Matos. Uh, so Nicole Matos is also a serial entrepreneur, a Métis woman, a wife and mother of three. Since 2009, Nicole has been the CEO and founder of Rivet Management, which is a full service design and construction company. Nicole also started a new business during COVID called Uni, which is an online local food market platform. You can also read more about Nicole in the Miguam Makwa Ikwe report on page 11. Um, but uh, first, uh, Crystal. Um, I'll invite you to share with our participants today. Hi, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. So my COVID story is a little bit different. Um, you know, I'd love to be here and explain to you uh, the importance of hustling hard, um, but that's not why I'm here. Uh, my name is Crystal Lucier. I'm an accountant. I'm a small business um, entrepreneurial expert. I give assistance to local small businesses to start up and continue through their business. Um, we do a lot of knowledge sharing. So we help people to understand what their financials look like. Um, I know that Lisa had mentioned that women in business are more often to develop relationships, which is very true and something that I've always held um, as important for me. And as we moved into COVID, I kind of, as a woman, as a mother, as um, an Indigenous woman with Indigenous clients, it was important to me to take on a lot of that load and help people wherever I could. Unfortunately, I wasn't staying true to my own culture and my own roots. I wasn't taking care of myself. And um, I fell into a significant illness. And during COVID, um, my exposure to uh, becoming sick and having a business to run, being an entrepreneur um, and being told by everyone around me that now is the time to pivot and hustle. I was also saying this to a lot of my clients and what I was finding was that really what I needed to do was um, rest, re-indulge myself in my, my culture, um, take care of myself, find herbal remedies and find balance in my life, which is very, very difficult to do as an entrepreneur. Um, I am from Muskeg Lake Cree Nation. I do now live just north of St. Albert. Um, so I am close to both Alexis uh, Nakota Sioux, as well as Alexander. Um, so it is important for me to ensure that I'm still connecting with my roots, 
And I found that in doing that, in having discussions with elders about my own illness that has come from being overwhelmed um, and overrun, I'm finding that I'm rediscovering uh, herbal remedies and learning to be more graceful with myself. And so I find now that the message that I'm giving to people is not um, hustle, understand your financials. The message I'm giving is don't forget to be graceful with yourself. And as much as you, there's so much to learn, there's so much to know, there's so many people to connect with, this is an unprecedented time. And we are all going through much more than we ever thought that we would have to, especially as women, especially as entrepreneurs, and especially as an Indigenous community. So don't forget to absorb the parts of your culture that help you to be well and find balance. Thank you so much, um, Crystal, for sharing that with us. I think that that's an important lesson that anyone um, can take away, uh, especially during COVID. Um, you know, I, I, I feel lucky sometimes to still be working, um, but it's like as soon as the pandemic hit, I was 40 times busier um, because there was just so much to be done. Um, and there's um, there's less boundaries now in terms of meetings because you don't really need to get to and from anywhere. So you can pretty much just be back to back every day if that's um, something that exactly. you don't really take control of. Well, and that's something that Elizabeth had mentioned as well, right? Um, you know, when Dr. Elizabeth mentioned that you go from meeting to meeting, you go from virtual face-to-face um, -face meeting to virtual face-to-face -face meeting. And I don't think that as women and as Indigenous women that we're not taking the moment to breathe and embrace who we are to help maintain that balance and heal ourselves. Yeah, yeah that's really important. And, and something that I've been working through as well too, because I feel like if I'm too back to back, I can't really be invested or intentional um, in the meeting that I'm in because I'm either thinking about the next meeting or the meeting I just came from, or I'm late for one and then my whole day is thrown off. Um, and so we yeah, have responsibility to ourselves and our families as well to be well, right? So as much as that pivot, the online presence, um, the continual meetings, as, as much as that's important through all of this, I really just feel that the message right now is to be graceful with ourselves because we aren't meant to take on the world. Yeah, that's very, that's very true and very powerful. Um, Nicole, I'll invite uh, you to share with us. Hello, can you guys all hear me? Yeah. Um, so my name is Nicole. Um, I have two businesses, Rivet Management and Uni Food Technologies. Um, I just, I just loved what um, what Crystal had to say. It's so true. I was talking about that in a business meeting the other day about learning to say no. Like there's so many. Like even though there's things that are hard, there's so many opportunities right now. There's so many like webinars and courses and seminars and everything like that online and they're more affordable and and there are these opportunities and I've definitely um, gotten into that path where I've over committed myself um, with things back to back so thanks for sharing that Crystal um, so with my business um, my uh, I guess established business is rivet management so we do construction and design um, partially for major home renovations and then also for commercial tenant improvements. So you can see our office behind me. What's well, just a picture though. <laughs> um, so we really had to pivot our business during um, COVID. Um, we had a few million dollars worth of contracts. We still have like our best year yet. Um, and last summer we had over, I think over $3 million of contracts had to go through which all canceled. So we went from having our best year to um, like, maybe having like one small project at a time, like just enough to like cover payroll and, and some basic um, expenses and stuff. So um, what it was is a lot of our um, key clients were, you know, uh, medi spas, restaurants, um, dental clinics, uh, you know, a lot of the different businesses that were affected. Um, and so their businesses closed down, which in effect hit our business. Um, so 
I mean, partially we picked up a little bit more residential work than we normally would do, which helped keep like keep us going, I guess, for a while. Um, but then we've also just been working really hard. I don't, I can't say that we have a magic solution and everything's fixed or anything, but um, we've just been trying to target like some new different groups and learn more about them. Um, we've been trying to work, I've always wanted to work on like figure out more about like the set asides of the different, um, you know, projects going on like in the Métis community and things like that. Um, and so I've been taking more time to try to figure that all out. Um, it's, it's a lot though, like <laughs> trying to navigate how to get those government contracts and stuff. Um, and so far they've all kind of gone awarded to like the bigger companies, but I'm convinced we'll figure it out <laughs> at some point or another, I hope. Um, cause I think it would do a lot to make me just feel, um, good about giving back to, um, like to all those communities. So, um, we've been working on that. Um, Another thing I did through COVID was um, there was a period of time where we were at home for a week or two um, or maybe longer. I don't know. Time is not existent anymore. I don't know if that's for anyone else, but um, so I was at home and I was watching a Netflix series on, they were traveling the world, looking at different um, food sourcing and different um, sustainability options and things like that. And, uh, I grew up on a farm out kind of by Lamont. I don't know if people know where that is, but it's kind of Northeast of Edmonton. Um, and I grew up on a farm there. It was a small, not a fancy farm. Everything was kind of falling down and <laughs> broken and stuff. But, um, we had always eaten like farm fresh, farm fresh food, right. Uh, between neighbors and people we knew in the community. And I all of a sudden had this big moment, you know, no one in my family is out on the farm anymore. I've lost touch with a lot of that community. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my goodness, I've not raised my kids in that way at all. Um, they don't eat that way. I need to connect them with that. And I felt this real longing to kind of um, get back to knowing where my food was coming from, what my kids are eating. Um, and really like so many of us wanting to support our people, right? Um, and so that's kind of how my new business was launched. And so um, the best thing about that is through all of these times as women, I think part of what we want to do is um, we want to look after people. I think it's like in our nature and construction and design business <laughs> is not much as it's nice to do, you know, nice projects and put out pretty things. It's not like a feel good industry. <laughs> um, and so this was an opportunity for me to do something that I really felt good about that I could give back on. Um, so one thing we plan to do is we're planning to basically people will be able to have their own little marketplace on our app to sell their own products um, at a very, very affordable rate. And one thing that we are planning on doing is offering free profiles for Indigenous businesses. Um, so those are a few things that I've done. Um, other opportunities I've had, um, I've been taking some um, free classes at night for Startup Edmonton. Um, so that's for the new business learning the tech world that I didn't know anything about because um, construction is not a very technical industry. And then I've actually been taking a really fantastic course through Alberta Women Entrepreneurs. Um, I don't know if everybody's involved with Alberta Women Entrepreneurs, but if you're not start <laughs> like tomorrow. Um, I wish I'd done it years ago with my business. Uh, so the great thing is you've heard about a bunch of their programs that they have earlier on. But the other thing I'd highlight is that like a few years ago, I had talked to them and said, you know, um, I wish there was more programs for a business that's scaling and trying to overcome some of the different hurdles. And like, they really listen. And they, they um, started offering a new program called Bold Leadership. And so they're actually helping. I've got coaching um, really specific to what my business needs, which is like looking at, um, I think the course is called digital transformation. So um, helping us kind of evaluate our businesses and teaching us technical things so that we, um, I don't know about, like for me, my kids come to me even with like Google Docs and stuff like that, and or like a Chromebook, and I can't even figure out how to turn the thing on because I've been on a Mac for 12 years. And I don't even have the time to know what they're talking about. And then to lead a company and trying to do different things, people sometimes talk another language to me. So um, yeah, I, um, yeah, it's been really fantastic because they've been helping us walk through evaluating our businesses and then helping us kind of come up with like a plan for how to um, implement that and how to um, kind of make processes a little bit easier. So 
Um, those are some of the things that I've really pivoted to try to change. So we're trying to put in more like automations and things like that in our business and trying to like work smarter, not harder. Um, and I, I think the biggest lesson I would say is that um, the biggest lesson I've learned is number one, get involved way sooner with like, if you're at, like, on a call like this, then that's fantastic. Um, that is so great. I didn't, I always felt like I had to be successful first and then connect. And then I connected and I was like, what was I doing? I should have been here ages ago. Um, there's people who are going through all the same things I'm going through. Um, so I'd say connect really early and like talk to people. Um, some of my I think honestly, the things that have taken me through COVID is the fact that I could call people and I knew people in business and knew what I was going through. And if nothing else, we could just talk and commiserate <laughs> about what we were going through. And um, that has been so valuable to me. So. Thank you so much for sharing, Nicole. Um, I'm going to pass it now to my colleague, Kara Thorvaldson, who's going to uh, moderate the next part of our discussion. Hello everyone and thank you Crystal and Nicole for sharing your stories and being here today and thank you to all of our ecosystem partners who came to share their resources and opportunities in their networks that was fantastic so I know we don't have a lot of time left but I want to pose a couple questions to our entrepreneurs and also I'd like to invite any of our participants if you feel inclined to answer any of these questions you can either unmute yourself and offer your comment or question, or you can throw it in the chat. Um, our colleague Anita will be monitoring the chat. So yeah, I'll start with our first question. And Crystal and Nicole, you both touched on this. Um, so our first question is, have you experienced any unique opportunities or challenges as a result of pivoting your business? Mm -hmm. I think um, if I could, the biggest challenge for me um, in my industry, when people are dealing with finances, they want to connect on a personal level. And I actually had COVID in April. So when I was sick, that's when we decided we were not doing any meetings anymore at all. Um, we were doing porch pickups for people that weren't doing well. You know, we had opportunities to connect, but we weren't connecting with people. Um, and there was a lot of pushback about that. Even when we were forced to work from home with not taking meetings when we were on complete lockdown, people were still pushing, pushing, pushing. Um, and so it really led me to um, change the relationship that I have with my clients so that they felt more comfortable dealing with me in a remote setting. Thank you for sharing. Nicole, did you have something to add? Um, I think I probably kind of touched on it, like just the opportunity for a lot more education um, that I wouldn't have had access to previously, like for the amount of education I've had through COVID um, without, I, I never would have been able to afford that education. Um, or like, I probably wouldn't have even known about a lot of it either. So um, I would say the biggest thing is education. I just give the, the warning with that is that um, I've really had to watch it every time and I get like all the different newsletters from all the different groups. And like, I'm always like, oh, I want to do that. Oh, I want to do that. And I, like, you have to learn to set, say no to some and like prioritize it as well. Um, so yeah, I would just say that that would be the thing to concentrate on. Like, it's hard. It's kind of that fear of missing out. Like I'm fear, I have fear of missing out of an opportunity, especially right now when my business is um, I wouldn't say struggling anymore, but it's not thriving. And so to pass up an opportunity, like I can't afford <laughs> to pass up an opportunity. So trying to like weed through what, what to do and what not to do can be a bit of a challenge. Thank you for sharing. And yeah, Crystal um, touched on that a little bit when she spoke as well, making space for ourselves, right? And realizing there are so many opportunities out there and we need to prioritize sometimes, even though we want to be able to go to everything and experience everything. Um, again, I would like to invite anyone to unmute themselves if they would like to join in on the conversation. Otherwise, we will move to the next question, but you can feel free to also throw anything in the chat, anything that's on your mind. 
So our second question is going forward, what does Indigenous women's entrepreneurship look like for you? Uh, what needs to happen in the Alberta ecosystem to help support the future of Indigenous women entrepreneurs? So I think for me, um, engaging in asking for help is um, something that's really been pivotal for me lately. So using Alberta women entrepreneurs to make connections where I can uh, receive some assistance where I struggle. And I personally tend to come to groups to provide knowledge and information to feel like I'm being helpful. Um, and in that often I neglect my own needs to find my own connections. And so for me moving forward, um, you know, being a part of Alberta Women Entrepreneur is really about um, connecting and finding my own resources, not just helping other people. I love what you were saying about, yeah, like, um asking for help in different ways. I think that's, that's definitely helped me a lot as well. Um, I belong to a few different groups um, where business groups of different types and sizes. Um, but one of the ones I've really been enjoying lately has been there's a small group of women in Sherwood Park where our businesses are all kind of the same size. And every two weeks, we kind of have a set Zoom call for an hour and a half. And we just kind of you know, each take a turn saying like what's going well and what we, the biggest thing we need help with is. Um, and it's amazing when people like, people come and help you. It's been fantastic. Um, and I would say the other thing is have patience when you ask for help because, um, you know, some of the things I identified maybe like a year ago or two years ago, you know, I'd sat at a round table with Western Economic Diversification um, and I, you know, had talked to AWE and it, like the change doesn't happen overnight either, but they are listening and they are working at it. And so just stay connected. Um, you know, like some of the big problems I had was, you know, financing and funding and things like that. And so now I know of so many opportunities. So um, yeah, patience. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, I totally agree with what you both said, Crystal and Nicole. And the truth is there's so many resources available to entrepreneurs like Community Futures and Alberta Women Entrepreneur, all of these systems that are in place. And so what I find when an entrepreneur comes through the door is they're really great at what they do. Like, let's say they make and sell widgets. They're really amazing at that. But then we talk them through, that's great. But do you know how to market your business? Or do you know how to do your bookkeeping? Because if you have an issue in your bookkeeping or accounting, I'm sure Crystal, you know, your entire ship will sink, not because you didn't have a great idea. It's just you didn't set your business up properly. And so I think that the best advice I could give is try to connect and reach out to these organizations. And most of us are free for the most part for the advice and information part. So just plug yourself in and mentorship again, Nicole, great, such an important piece to your, to your business. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Thank you for sharing Lisa. Um, I believe we will be sharing a lot of information in our post event communications. So if you do want to reach out to anyone from a particular organization, you'll have the opportunity to do that through the communications that we send out afterwards. I would like to also bring up that Denise put a beautiful um, or wonderful quote here in our chat that I'm going to read or Denise, would you like to speak to that. Um, Feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity once again. I feel like I'm so blessed to hear, hear all you women and the stories, the presentations, all so beautiful. And, the, and what I recognize them and just them giving voice to is the spirit of growth within each of you. And, um, and so I, what I wrote in the chat, if you haven't read it, is COVID sure has encouraged us to exercise our adaptability to relationality. And when I say relationality, um, it is uh, um, almost a common knowledge and understanding as a people that we're taught that relationship matters. Uh, relationship to ourselves, relationship to community, relationship to the environment, uh, and to the universal beings. 
And so when I say relationality, I'm talking about everything uh, within that spiritual realm that feeds our body and mind and spirit. And so we do need each other. And, and illness and severity will cause us to, to truly reflect upon life for its importance, right? Our spirits are, I, I'm, I, I said growing, but I want to say and add, we are expanding. You are always expanding, each one of you. Uh, and, and I reflected on this as part of, I'm also a doctoral student, and, and uh, I... I host uh, full moon ceremonies for women. And in this, I reflect upon our journey as women throughout history and, the, and moreover in the past 500 years, what that has meant. And in the short of the long example or expression, I said to myself, wow, you know, women historically were taught to keep up, play harder, and as a man, now we're telling each other to recognize when to rest, find balance, and, and keep spiritually connected. And as I reflect on that, none of that is wrong and harsh. I just think that we've, we've always had this, this, um, this warrior stance as women. And when I say warrior, I'm not talking about war. Uh, not from the male perspective, not, not from a westernized view, but as a peaceful warrior. And women retain that, sustain that, maintain that. And, and we are constantly called upon to revive that and to carry that into the next generation and to share that and teach that, giving that back. And so I feel that everyone is on par. If you're called to rest, listen. And that's only because you have that spirit and, it, and you need that rejuvenation period. It's probably a regenesis within you uh, that needs to occur to spark that something extra and new. And so just to encourage you that that's beautiful what you're doing. And, and what a lovely uh, quote, Nicole. I just, that touched me because that's so true. And I remember thinking that way. You know, when I become successful, I will connect. But no, you're right. We should start early. That's why it's important to have relationships at all levels, right? We are all worthy and deserving of those. And he had me thinking about our youth and our young women and what they need. And so with that, I'll just leave it at that. And I just want to thank you all one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. What beautiful and impactful words that I believe sum up our conversation here today and I think that we'll leave it off at that unless anyone has any last uh, minute contributions to the conversation otherwise I will pass it back to Ashley and thank you all for participating thanks so much uh, everyone for um, sharing your thoughts today um, for listening um, if you brought a presentation thank you for bringing you know your time and energy um, and passion about your program to share it um, with uh, the Alberta ecosystem and you know thank you so much uh, to um, elder Denise Montour for starting us off um, at the beginning of the circle and you know sharing uh, during the sharing session I think that um, and you know to Nicole and Crystal as well I think that uh, the conversation for me at least uh, I really enjoyed listening to it because um, you were all touching upon, you know, the, I guess the really important message of just remembering that through, you know, being an entrepreneur, a business owner, um, being a mother, all of these things, it's important to always be connected to yourself um, and not to lose yourself or your health or anything, um, I guess, in the busyness of life. 
um, bringing you back to what Crystal uh, shared at the beginning, you know, just like this feeling where we're all extremely busy, um, like how, and you know, this, this feeling of like this need that you have to be busy in order to feel like you're being productive or getting anything done. Um, I think when you join um, these different support circles and you can learn to ask for help, like what Nicole was saying, um, that's also very profoundly, profoundly helpful. And I, I think when you find circles of, you know, even just other Indigenous women where you have the opportunity to share um, some of your feelings uh, and just relate to one another, you see, and especially in a situation like this, that others are feeling the same way. I think. Um, kind of across the board, um, whatever steam we were all running on last year is kind of running out and everybody's hitting a wall right now with COVID. Like it's just, it's been a really long time. So I just think being, you know, being, uh, I guess, I can't remember the exact word that was used. Maybe it was like being gracious with yourself and, you know, taking time for yourself. That's so important. Uh, I was in a circle and I was sharing uh, with the women there that I was just stressed out because prior to COVID, I was someone who was like really loved 6 a.m. spin class. I'd be up at like 5.30 driving to spin class. And then I'd always have this early start to my day because I'm already up. I'm not gonna go back to bed. And that was um, something that I found to be really healing for myself. But then of course, when COVID happened, um, everything shut down and I was just waking up every day at like eight or 9.30 and just feeling so unproductive. And I was just really kind of down on myself about it. And so I brought this up in the circle. Um, and one of the women said, you know, if you're sleeping that late, it's probably just because your body needs the sleep. And it was just, it was such a simple, uh, I guess, thing to bring to my attention, but it was true. So as soon as I stopped stressing about, you know, sleeping all the time, um, I was able to find that rest and, you know, bring that balance back. And so I think I've just enjoyed what everyone had to share today. And we have a couple minutes left. I don't want to just ramble on. I don't know, Bev and Sammy, do you have anything to share? I just wanted to share, I think that, um, I say that it's your network that's going to be your biggest asset to your business, but it's also the network is there for support. And um, I think those are the things that we're realizing it's like I said, I mentioned before, it's, it's not con transactional, it's relational. That's what business is about. And I think women do it better than anyone else. So um, I, I can, can consider that having this circle is sacred and I, I really appreciate all the women that have been able to make it and will continue to, to build this circle as we move forward and I really appreciate that Ashley helped to, to lead the process that they need and, and bring these women together. I had a, a woman entrepreneur who could not make it today. Um, her name is Esther Jacobs from Sedena a Nation and she had a catering business and she's run it for a long time. And her husband's a rancher. They've been self-employed all of their lives. And so um, her catering business, there was no more work for her uh, because of COVID. And so she pivoted to re revive her sewing and she's sewing these beautiful pillows with that velour indigenous design. And she's just loving it. And uh, she posted on my Facebook, she's a friend on Facebook, and uh, she said that she had, um, there was an order of 40 fell through. And I was like, wow, okay. So she's thinking on Facebook, like, how can I, what can I do to sell these? And all the women that responded with ideas and things like that. And, and so I was telling Marcella about this is what women are, this is what businesses are facing, right? On a day-to-day -day basis. And she said, well, why don't we buy them? Why don't we buy them all <laughs> and um, gift them, right? And so I, I, I was able to put in an order and her business is, is thriving. She's at a dental office. She had a dental emergency. Can you imagine? Like, oh. So um, she just wanted to send her regards to everyone. Her name is Esther Jacobs and uh, they run Easel Head Ranch and um, 
she's uh, just like, once you make that relationship, it's like lifetime. So it's what I appreciate about this circle for Indigenous and non-Indigenous. It's, it's just amazing. So thank you. Thanks, Bev. Uh, Sammy? Yeah, I just wanted to say um, thank you so much for everyone sharing their stories. Uh, very inspiring and very heartwarming um, to hear. Uh, I know it's definitely, I took a lot away from each and every one of you and I needed to hear that myself. So I just wanted to really give my, my, my thanks and yeah, thanks. <laughs> That's all I wanted to say, yeah. Okay, well, miigwech to all of our presenters and speakers and everyone who shared. Um, we'll send out all the information um, probably tomorrow or Wednesday. Um, please enjoy the rest of your day and remember the message of take care of yourself. Miigwech. <laughs>